Okay, so uh, I guess I'll just start by saying that this is going to be a whiteboard talk. So if people at the back can't see, so feel free to move up in front. Um, okay, so uh, we have the pleasure of having uh, Dr. Matt Hastings with us today. Uh, Dr. Hastings is a partner researcher in Microsoft and he works with their quantum group. Um, so he is a mathematical physicist. He started off with his PhD from MIT in condensed matter physics and he has worked on a very wide range of topics going from physics to theoretical computer science um, and even in problems in pure mathematics. So his work has appeared in journals in physics, math journals, and recently in computer science conferences. Um, he is known for a very large number of extremely seminal results in quantum information theory, many body physics. Um, so for example, a few of his famous results include disproving the additivity conjecture for quantum channel capacities, uh, proving the higher dimensional Liebschild's Mattis theorem, which was responsible for showing an area law for gapped uh, 1D Hamiltonians, um, and which was later on developed into giving a full proof of the complexity classification of gapped quantum Hamiltonians. And recently he has been uh, working on developing novel quantum codes, and that's, I guess, what he's going to be telling us a little bit about today. Yeah, so welcome okay. and thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and let me encourage any questions during the talk. Uh, this is gonna be a whiteboard talk, as said, so hopefully I can be a little more uh, interactive. Um, just some background. Uh, as mentioned, you know, I, I work at Microsoft. Microsoft has a project to try to build a quantum computer. Why? Well, there's a number of problems for which a quantum computer might be exponentially faster than any classical computer. It's not many of the problems you care about. It offers no advantage. But for some problems, particularly things in simulating quantum systems, which are very important in chemistry and biology. Um, for these problems, it can offer an enormous speed up. So we have a, a program to try to build a quantum computer. Um, our hope is that by using a new kind of qubit, these so-called Majorana qubits, we'll be able to obtain much, much lower error rates than uh, can be obtained with conventional qubits. Um, but even if this hope comes to pass, even if we get really good uh, Majorana qubits. Really good is sort of pretty bad by the standards of um, classical computation. So, you know, if you think about your laptop, I see some laptops and probably everyone's carrying a cell phone. Those things have billions of transistors in them and they're just basically not making any mistakes. You know, every time a logic gate goes, it's pretty much just giving the right answer. Whereas for a quantum gate, um, you know, a 10 to the minus 2 probability of making an error is kind of where a lot of research is nowadays. We might hope maybe to get to say 10 to the minus 6 would be like a dream. But even at that point, if you want to run a long quantum algorithm, you have to be correcting errors as you go. So better qubits might lessen the need for error correction, but you have to be correcting errors. So what I'm going to be talking about is some work on quantum coding theory. And this is a kind of thing that every, um, every group trying to make a quantum computer at some point is going to run into. The gates are just not as good as the classical gates. And somehow you need to do some kind of error correction. Um, so that's what I'll be talking about. Um, I should mention that in the early days of classical computation, uh, error correction was also um, a big question because the early classical computers had higher error rates. So there was a question about how can you fix the errors as it occurs. Also, as computers get larger, you start having to worry about error correction for cloud devices. Um, but for the purpose of sort of something like your laptop, you don't need to worry too much about error correction. The gates are just good. Um, so let me start with a bit of an introduction to classical coding theory, just classical coding theory. And this is also um, an incredibly practical subject because while your laptops or cell phones, the device, the hardware inside it is almost perfect in terms of its gates. If you talk on your cell phone, um, your voice gets encoded into some digital signal that gets transmitted to a base station. And there may be some errors as it gets transmitted. And so these errors need to be fixed. So um, sort of a simple model people have is that there's, say, two people, say, conventionally called Alice and Bob, and Alice wants to send some message to Bob. So perhaps Alice wants to send a bit. Maybe she just wants to send a 1 or a 0 to Bob. So what she might do is she might encode it in some redundant way. So for example, a simple code called the repetition code would be to take the 1, and instead of sending 1, you just say 1, 1, 1. You say it three times. Or instead of sending a 0, you send three zeros. Now if some error occurs, Let's say this, she wanted to send a one, one of the bits got flipped. So this was the encoding, 
But somehow what Bob got was 110 because the last bit got flipped. There was some problem in the channel, whether it was the radio communication or whatever communication channel existed between Alice and Bob. Bob can look at this 110 and guess, ah, Alice probably meant to send a 1. Because you could get this 110 by just flipping one bit from here. But if she meant to send a 0, it would require two mistakes to get to send the 110. So Bob would guess, OK, probably she sent a 1. And so in this way, you're able to reduce the probability of error. Now, this is an enormous field, classical coding theory. Um, there's a lot of beautiful mathematics and a lot of practical importance. You know, Better codes allow you to transmit more information with less errors. So that means that the companies don't need to put as many cell phone towers up, for example, to attain the same performance. So there's a, a major practical interest in doing uh, things like this. And it's an enormous field. And I'm just going to scratch the surface of it. So a large class of codes that are important are so-called parity check codes. These are codes where, let's say here Alice had some bit. And she encoded into three bits, b1, b2, b3, which are all 0 or 1. Now, if you look at the code words she sent, the code words means this is a code word. It's something that she can send. It's an encoding of her message. It's going to satisfy a property that, say, the XOR of the first two bits is 0, and the XOR of the second two bits is 0. So there's some checks on the parity. And this is an important class of codes, is that the messages Alice will send will be strings of bits that obey certain constraints. In this case, the XOR of these two bits is the same, and the XOR of these two bits is the same. More generally, Alice could have you know, the XOR of bits 1, 3, and 7 is 0, the XOR of bits 8, 9, and 14 is 0, and so on. And if you do some simple counting, you can say, well, Alice has, um, we'll have, I'll get into this notation later. Um, Sometimes you talk about an NKD code, where this is the number of bits sent. In this case, it's 3 sent. So it's 3 bits. This is the, that is sent over the channel. This is the number of actual bits, uh, number of bits of information, which is just 1. Alice is only sending just 1 bit across the channel. And D is, in this case, 3. It's how many errors it takes to confuse, completely confuse one code word to another, how far apart the code words are. Um, so this difference between N and K, the number of bits used versus the number of bits sent. Now, you'd like K to be as large as possible and N as small as possible because that's more efficient. Um, the, the difference is precisely like the number of these independent parity checks. Every time you put in a parity check, it says, oh, one of these bits in here is, uh, is um, just redundant. It's redundant information. So, so we can say n minus k is number of parity checks. And this is all going to have an analog in classical computation. Uh, sorry, in quantum computation. Um, OK. So that's like the, the very rapid review of classical coding theory. And um, I'll just mention one last thing. A very important class is what are called low density parity check codes, where uh, these parity checks only involve a few bits at a time. So, like, here, they, they only involve two bits. Uh, codes where they involve two, three, four bits, those are some of the most practical ones. And in quantum purposes, those will also be some of the most possible uh, important ones. OK, so that's like the rapid introduction to classical coding theory. Now we need the um, very rapid introduction to quantum mechanics. Um, yeah? Can you switch to a blue pen or a darker colored pen that might help some people? Uh, sure, sure, yeah. Thanks for telling me. I'll, I'll switch now. And let me know if it's better, and I'll try a green, too. Um, OK, so uh, if I had been giving a uh, slide talk, which I'm not, but if I had been giving a slide talk, a demo I like to do is to hold a pair of polarized sunglasses in front of the projector, uh, because most projectors are sending out polarized light. So um, if you hold a pair of polarized sunglasses in front of a projector and rotate it, depending upon the angle, sometimes it'll let all the light through. And if you rotate it, then it won't let any light through. Or if you, you know, the whole point of polarized sunglasses, why people wear them, like you look at the water, and um, depending upon the polarization of light, it, uh, some light gets through and some doesn't. The light that reflects off the water will have a certain polarization and will be blocked by the polarized sunglasses. So, um, how do polarized sunglasses work? This is part of like the rapid introduction to quantum mechanics. Well, um, light. Uh, can be described. How do you describe what light is? So you can describe light by two polarizations, say, if you had a pair of polarized sunglasses. Um, a horizontal polarization or a vertical polarization. So like 
polarized horizontally or polarized vertically, and the polarized sunglasses will let one polarization through and completely block the other polarization. And the appropriate description of nature, right? Like, so how do we describe nature? If you think about Newtonian classical mechanics, what you learned in, you know, just like classical physics, um, the state of the world is just a bunch of real numbers. Where things are, you know, like this is at this position and has this momentum. Well, so for quantum mechanics, the state of the world is some vector. And in this case, the vector is in two dimensions. And this axis we can call the vertical. And this would be the horizontal. Actually, that's kind of silly. I should make, of course, this one the horizontal and that one the vertical. That would be a little, a little nicer, right? So this would just be the two polarizations of the, of the photon. And if the vector is pointing this way, it means it's a horizontally polarized photon. Um, if it's pointing the opposite way, actually, the sign doesn't matter. So it's still hor horizontally polarized if it's pointing over here. Um, whereas if it's up here, this is a vertically polarized photon. So it can point this way or this way. Now, um, and the polarized sunglasses will, if the vector is in it, well, basically, if the polarized sunglasses are horizontal, they'll take the vector and just project out any component that's vertical and just force it to go this way. So if the vector was originally horizontal, nothing's left. It destroys a the photon. No photon gets through. Now, if you go here, this would be a photon polarized sort of somewhere between vertical and horizontal. Um, and uh, in this case, some of it will get through. You can project in like, there's a, there's a probability less than one that the photon gets through. And um, this is, you know, you don't see it probabilistically because there's so much light coming through um, the, the polarized sunglasses, you just see a dimming. So some fraction of the light gets through, but rather than seeing like sometimes light, sometimes no light, you just see less light, a dimming. Um, so this is like the state of a, um, of a, uh, uh, of a single photon. Now, if you have two photons, the state is a vector in a four-dimensional space. If you have three, the state is a vector in an eight-dimensional space, and so on. So the state is a vector in a space that is um, uh, uh, exponentially large in the number of particles. It's, 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 um, so considering, for example, all the possible is this one's horizontal, this one's vertical, this one's vertical, and so on. There's every single one of these, the state is this, this vector in this large space. Um, and this gives rise to a, a very interesting property, which is going to be real important for the rapid introduction to quantum uh, um, coding theory. And this property is called no cloning. So what is no cloning? Well, people are going to build quantum computers, hopefully, and these will do some actions on different quantum states. You can have a quantum computer that takes a quantum state and transforms it in some way. And one thing it can't do is it can't just clone the quantum state. It can't just copy the quantum state. So what do I mean? I'm going to switch notation. Um, so I'm going to use, uh, this is kind of a standard notation for a quantum state. And I'm going to write 0 and 1 instead of horizontal and vertical. So this is just this little vertical line in this like thing here. Just says, like, what's in between is a quantum state. And I'm just going to use 0 and 1 for my quantum state instead of horizontal and vertical. So they look a little bit more like bits. Um, so you could imagine some device that says, OK, it's going to take a single one and send it into 2 pointing up, like that. Such a device could exist. And that takes a 0 and sends it into two zeros. Essentially, it's like that repetition code. It, it copies it. Um, however, what this does, if you take 1 plus 0, so something that would be like at 45 degrees, a, a photon that's neither polarized vertically nor horizontally, but partway in between, it does not send it into a 0 plus a 1 times another 0 plus a 1. Instead, everything is linear. It actually just sends it into a 1 and a 1 and a 0 and a 0, a copy like that. So you can't just like, there's no way to copy the state. There is no device that will send a horizontal photon to a horizontal, a vertical to a vertical, and something in between. Sorry, one horizontal to two horizontal, one vertical to two vertical, and one thing in between to two things in between. It's just it's not physically possible. Um, and that's, that's a, a limitation imposed by the laws of physics. Um, OK, so now this no cloning uh, is a, um, 
major problem when it comes to building quantum codes. And sort of, for, I think for a time, there was even a doubt as to whether a quantum code was possible. Um, you know, people had talked about quantum computation. Um, it had been studied for some time. Um, but it wasn't really until Peter Shore uh, came up with the first quantum codes that people realized, like, oh, yeah, you actually can error correct. Um, because it seems, it seems like a problem that if, uh, it, you know, if, if you encode, um, say, with the repetition code, you're trying to copy the state. And it seemed like it, there was no way to do it. But uh, Peter Shore was able to figure out how to do that. And um, I'll explain a simple quantum code. Um, so to explain the simple quantum code, it's going to be like one of these parity check codes. But I want to slightly change my notation just because um, I will feel better for using this notation because it will accord with the notation used in the field. So I apologize for yet another notation. Um, so I had been writing bits like b1, b2, and I had been saying like b1 plus b2 xor b2 equals 0. This was a Boolean, uh, Boolean addition for the repetition code. I'm going to slightly change notation. Instead of saying bits, I'm going to write z z sub i, z1, z2, and so on. And z will be uh, either plus 1 or minus 1. Um, and so let's say plus 1 will correspond to the 0 bit, and minus 1 will correspond to the 1 bit. So just instead of my bits being 0 or 1, my bits will be 1 or minus 1. And so if I wanted to describe the repetition code, I would say it, instead of saying it's b1 plus b2 equals 0, I would just say it's z1 times z2 equals plus 1 for example, and z2 times z3 equals plus 1. So that's just a notation that will make me feel better because it's the standard one in the field. Um, OK, so now let me give the uh, first, like a really simple quantum code using this notation. So we need one other piece of information, um, which is that there's really two kinds of errors that can occur as quantum errors. One kind of error is a bit flip error. The bit flip error is where a bit comes in and it gets flipped from up to down. The other kind of error is a phase error. A phase error where something, instead of say being 1 plus 0, it becomes 1 minus 0. 1 plus 0 and 1 minus 0 are two different states. If you think about a, a photon, actually one is, um, they're both not in this horizontal or vertical polarization. They're both at some angle, but they're at different angles. So um, the, uh, um, uh, um, a different kind of error is a phase error. So you need to be able to correct both of these kinds of errors. So uh, Peter Shor had the idea that in order to do that, what you really needed was two different codes. So one code, the simplest code that I can explain, has four qubits. We call them qubits instead of bits. And one of the checks is z1, z2, z3, z4 equals plus 1. So this is a very simple check on it. Um, it says that the product of all these, their, sort of their parity is plus 1. But the other is x1, x2, x3, x4 equals plus 1. And what is this x? Well, this x means, um, this x is, uh, so in order to get, if you have a, <laughs> At this point, I've kind of done, I know this is probably like a little bit like hand wavy and what's going on. Um, at this point, things will sort of become just like, here's the mathematical formalism and how it works. But I want to try and again correct, connect it to this idea of like a single, a single photon. Um, as a photon, you can say, okay, so it's horizontally polarized or vertical polarized. But another way to talk about it would be measurement in these two directions. That would be a completely good other way to talk about it. And you could talk about its direction here and here. Or you could pick all kinds of different ways. But let's say we just pick this one and this one and this one and this one. So this measurement outcome, if you measure it this way, that'll be its z. And if you measure it that way, that'll be its x. So you can have it like having some value of z or some value of x. And it doesn't definitely have the same value at time. If it has a certain z, so it's say definitely horizontally polarized, it's not polarized at either of these angles. So um, the check will involve these four Particle, these four qubits, and one check will be that this product of them will be plus one, and then the other check will be that this product will be plus one. Um, so Peter Shore's idea was that what you really needed was two different codes. One code was a code that was um, correcting one kind of errors, and this corrects errors in bit flips, and this corrects errors in phase, and then if you had both these codes at the same time, you could correct all the errors. And what kind of code is this? People talk about an NK decode. 
exactly as before. So this is the number of qubits. This is the amount of information, the amount of quantum information it can encode. And this is the distance. The distance is um, how many errors it takes in order to get something that you can't tell that any error happened. Um, there's four bits here. Now, it's exactly the same as before. K is, uh, K is 4 minus 2. It's the number of bits you have minus these two constraints you put on it, the number of bits minus the number of these parity checks. But now the parity checks have become generalized instead of just in one basis, they're in some other basis as well. And then the distance is, um, in this case, 2. And what the distance means is, um, well, you have these two codes here. And uh, um, this code is a distance 2 code against X checks. This code corrects against one kind of error, and this code corrects against another kind of error. They're two very simple codes. This is just a code that's on four bits says their parity is plus one. So the allowed things, if you have four bits that's parity is plus one, would be like all zeros, all zeros and two ones, like that. Well, you can just draw it all. So all the different ways of having two ones and then finally four ones. And the distance between them is two. The closest distance between any of them is two. Any one error will create an observed parity, but two will be undetectable. And then this code works the same, and it's the same code, but in a different basis. Um, any, any questions? Um, uh, is, is this making sense or? Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> makes sense to you. Uh, but yeah. Uh, so the, the Z1234 check is uh, uh, detecting face flip errors? Uh, so this, is this one is detecting bit flip errors, actually. I mean, typically we say that the bit flip error the, is the thing that flips the value of Z and the phase that flips the value of X. That's just a convention, though, because, I mean, they just correspond to different bases and there's no reason to prefer one or the other. But in the conventional way people would talk, they would say this is correcting bit flip and this is correcting phase. Yeah? Don't you ignore with that check if you have a even number of flips? Yes, if you have an even number of flips, this won't detect it. So this is, that's why this is only a distance two code. The one I was showing you before is a distance three. This is only a distance two code. So it's only an error detecting code. If an error occurs, you can detect that it occurs, but you don't know how to fix it. You don't have, like if it's a distance three code, remember I have said like, oh, it could be one, 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 or, and if, if it flipped, you had one, one, zero. Well, one, one, zero is probably one, 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 because it only required one flip instead of two. So you can correct an error. This is only an error detecting code. It can only detect an error. So it's not as good. Um, we can, and I will write down, uh, make bigger ones that are um, error correcting. In fact, I'll write down in a, in a little bit a family that'll correct, you know, as big a distance as you want. Uh, okay, so this is a, um, right, so this is, this, is a, uh, um, this is a very simple quantum code. Now, there's like a lot of steps that need to go from this kind of really simple quantum code to something that would actually be useful in a, um, in a computer. So like one thing is, as, as asked, this will only detect that an error occurred. It can't correct it. So we need bigger distance codes you know, um, in order to correct errors. Then there's another difference, which is there's a difference between error correction and fault tolerance. So in all this error correction, I was explaining it as Alice wants to send a message to Bob. Now, in that simple repetition code, Bob didn't need to do too much. If he got more ones than zeros, he guessed it was a bit one. If he got more zeros than ones, he guessed it was a bit zero. But in the codes actually used in practice, Bob is running some kind of sophisticated algorithm to do the error correction, to figure out as quickly as possible so that this will happen you know, in real time while you're listening to it, um, what, how to decode. Um, so Bob needs to do some sophisticated computation in order to fix it. But now imagine that Bob's computer itself was imperfect. The gates inside his computer were imperfect. So he would need to be correcting the errors that the gates in his computer generated as they were occurring. So he would use some kind of error correcting code like this inside his computer to like store the information. In his computer would be stored in, his, in some error correcting code. And as he operated on it to run these algorithms to correct the errors, more errors would occur, and he would have to fix them faster than they were created. And this seems like a difficult thing to do. Um, so if I were to give just a total just sort of weird analogy that's always in my head when I talk about this, um, if you had a task of like taking a piece of wood and cutting it to an accuracy of like an eighth of an inch, 
this would be easy to do. You know, you just get a ruler, you mark it by hand, and you just get a handsaw and you do it. It's no problem. Um, but if you had like a piece of metal that you wanted to machine to an accuracy of less than a thousandth of an inch, you obviously cannot do that by hand. There is no way you can have that accuracy by hand. You need to use machine tools. So you go to a machine tool shop. They have machine tools that can get this accuracy. But then you start thinking about it. Like, how were those machine tools made? The machine tools were obviously not made by hand because no person could make them to the needed accuracy. So those machine tools were made by other machine tools, which were made by other machine tools. And how did this happen that, you know, the earliest machine tools, like the earliest lathes were, the very first ones were built by hand and they were not very accurate. And now we have incredibly accurate ones that can, you know, how did this happen? Well, it was, it's a little bit like this idea of fault tolerance. They had some imperfect tools and they used them to build more accurate tools and those were used to build still more accurate tools and so on until you know nowadays um, that's what we have. Um, so a similar thing needs to happen in fault tolerance. As, as the errors are created, they need to be fixed as fast as they occur. Um, you're using these imperfect tools but you need to produce more and more accurate results out of these imperfect tools. Um, so, uh, and, and, and the last thing that I guess I'll mention that you, you might appreciate that there's some kind of threshold. So if your gates are good, you can fix them and get them better and better and better. But if your gates are not enough, not, are definitely not good at all, then there's no way to fix them. If your gates are just terrible, then the, the action of doing the computation to fix them introduces errors faster than you can fix it. And so there's some number called the threshold. And numbers, you might hear a number like around 1% is where you start being able to error correct. And, do fault tolerance and fix your imperfect gates, but at an enormous overhead. Um, so I'm gonna mention one last code before I give a, a scalable code. So this is like a generalization um, called a subsystem code. This code is kind of code is called a stabilizer code. Um, this code is a little bit difficult to build in hardware uh, because you have to measure these things. And what you have to do, the difficult thing you have to do is, and this was like one of the geniuses of Peter Shore's insight into coming up with quantum error correction, if I just go measure Z1 and Z2 and Z3 and Z4 and measure those four bits and then compute the product Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4, I've checked this, but now I've measured that encoded quantum information, which I'm trying not to do because that will mess up this check, that will destroy this, this, this information. Um, I can't kind of look at it. So I have to measure this guy, Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4, without individually measuring Z1 and Z2, Z2 and Z, Z, you know, without individually measuring. And similarly, I need to measure this one without making all the individual measurements. And um, so the kind of breakthrough idea is that, well, it's possible to measure this without individually measuring each of the things. There's some quantum circuit you can build, some sequence of gates using um, controlled not gates and, uh, um, some extra qubits called ancillary qubits to keep track of the results of these intermediate operations. But just quantum analogs are very standard gates that you would use um, to compute this, where you have some extra ancillary qubit and you sort of add or multiply, or whether you want to call it adding mod two or multiplying in this plus one, minus one, all these things onto it. And then at the end, you finally measure that one ancillary qubit. And that tells you this value without revealing any of these. Um, this, this is, uh, kind of a complicated circuit and it entails some overhead. You know, it's, it's the more comp the bigger these uh, checks are, the harder it's going to be to measure, the harder the device will be to build. So people started to think maybe it would be nice to reduce the weight of some of these checks. You know, this is four. If it only involved two at a time, this might be great. That would be a lot easier to measure than four at a time. Um, so an interesting idea came up with was called a uh, subsystem code. So this is called a stabilizer code. Stabilizer code. But there was another idea come up with called a subsystem code. And the idea behind that is, um, oh yeah, so before I say what a subsystem code is, I have to measure, mention one very important property of the stabilizer code. These two checks, measuring this one, doesn't disturb this one. Measuring this one doesn't disturb this one. So if you have a single photon of light, 
and you measure its horizontal vertical direction, that will destroy any information about it being in like this thing at some angle to it. And this is actually a, a nice little effect you can test. If you had like a horizontal polarizer and a vertical polarizer and you put them in front of each other, it'll just be black. But if you take another polarizer and you put it at 45 degrees in between the two of them, you take this one as this way, this one as this way, and you stick another one in at 45 degrees, suddenly light will start coming through. And that's because once you measure it in this direction by putting that polarizer, it forgets that initially it was that way. So you, you have to have some way, so some measurements disturb each other, but this measurement and this measurement do not disturb each other. And the reason they don't disturb each other is actually mathematically that if you, they intersect on an even number of qubits. So if you count each qubit where there's a z of one and an x of one, they intersect on an even number, so they don't like disturb each other. You can measure one without measuring the other. So there's a, uh, um, uh, a generalization called a subsystem code. Um, a subsystem code has some sort of simpler checks. And the checks for this thing in the subsystem code would be like this. Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4, X1, X3, and uh, X2, X4 in that particular pattern. So it's got four checks. Um, the uh, when you, once you measure Z1, Z2, and measure Z2, Z, Z3, Z4, that allows you to infer Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4. And measuring X1, X3, X2, X4 allows you to infer X1, X2, X3, X4. So it was kind of like that the obvious way to measure this was to measure each of these four things and take the product, but that didn't work. Well, say you measure two of them and another two, and then you take the product and two of these, and two of these, and you take the product. This reveals some information, but it doesn't tell you each of the individual Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4. You only learn a little bit about it. And in this case, there's um, four physical bits. Turns out that there's one logical bit, but it remains distance two. The reason there's one logical bit is that you um, uh, um, reveal some, but not all, of the information. And just for, just for those who are uh, um, perhaps like experts, the way you work out that there's one logical bit, these are the number of stabilizers in the code, the ones that are commute with everything. And the number of these is the number of logical bits is the number of qubits minus the number of stabilizers. And then there's some that are like left over, and that's minus a half the number of checks minus number of stabilizers. And this is kind of like the difference between checks and stabilizers is that there's some checks that disturb information when you measure them. And these checks that disturb information when you measure them say that you lose some of your encoded information. And in this case, it's 4 minus 2 minus 1. And so there's one logical bit left over. So this is a little easier to build because you only need to measure two things at a time. So this would be like a really easy quantum code to build because it's only four bits and you only measure two at a time. Um, okay, any more questions? Now I'm going to like start talking about like actual things that you would then want to build because these are kind of toy models and then no questions? Anyone? <laughs> okay, all right, cool. Yeah. So in uh, the usual proposition, uh, so you want your, your code word is an eigenstate of all of these. Okay? Yes, yes. Oh. Yes, yes. Um, okay, so um, these codes are too small in that they're, you know, they're, they're just on four qubits, they're only distance two, uh, they only allow you to detect errors, they don't allow you to fix errors. So for actual devices, we're going to need bigger codes. And sort of kind of a lot of research has pointed to a particular kind of code being useful for a lot of architectures. And the reason, one of the reasons that this code, called the surface code, has become useful is that, um, surface code or Torah code, um, has become useful is that many architectures, uh, the Microsoft architecture using Majorana's, architectures using superconducting qubits, architectures using spin qubits, many of them are actually laid out on a surface because that's, you know, that's how you like 
you, you know, attach things to the surface of some like gallium arsenide or whatever. Um, you know, like that's just like how you build a device. It's on the, on the surface of something. So many times you want to lay your code out on the surface of something. And so an important kind of code is called the uh, surface code. This is, this is like fits with that architecture. So what it is, is you draw, say, some grid like this. And there is one qubit on each edge. Every single edge of this, there's a qubit. Um, you can worry about what happens at the boundaries later. Uh, that's getting more advanced. Um, so we'll just not worry about that at the moment. Um, then what are the checks of the code? Well, one of the checks of the code is that for every plaquette, you have a Z check, Z check, one Z check per plaquette. And that Z check is just Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4 for the four qubits around the plaquette, calling these you know, Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4. So there's one Z check on every plaquette. So this is a parity check on every plaquette. Every check plaquette has some parity check. Then um, every vertex, one X check per vertex. Every vertex has one X check. And it's X1, X2, X3, X4 for the four edges attached to that vertex. So these are the checks. These are the checks of this, uh, of this system. So it has some checks in one basis and some in another. Um, the important thing is that these checks don't disturb each other. Uh, mathematically, we would say they commute with each other. Uh, so like this plaquette and this vertex, well, they just involve different qubits. So like measuring this doesn't disturb these ones. The important thing you need to check is like, oh, if I measure this vertex check, and this plaquette check, can I measure them both? And they, they don't disturb each other because they both, they overlap on an even number of qubits, on two qubits. So measuring one of them doesn't disrupt the ability to measure the other one. So it's possible to measure all these checks. Um, if you want to ask, well, this, this NKD code, NKD, well, so if this is laid out on some physical surface of size L by L, then there are roughly L squared qubits. If you do it carefully, two L squared, because there's one this way and one this way in each box. So if you just count, it's an area L squared. Um, the number of logical qubits, well, uh, for basically, it seems like there's the same number of checks as edges, right? Because like in, in this square, there's like, a plaquette check here and a vertex check at the bottom left corner and then an edge that way and an edge that way. And it, like you can just look at every square and say, okay, there's a qubit here and a qubit here and then a vertex here and a plaquette there. And that, if, I, if I just count that over all the squares, I've, counted, I've, I've got all the qubits, I've got all the vertices, I've got all the edges and I've got the same number. So it seems like it should be zero, but there's some redundancy in the checks. And if you actually count that some of the products of Merle plus one, if you actually check it, there's two two encoded qubits. Um, and the distance of the code, well, the distance of the code is kind of like the least weight error that will actually um, uh, get undetected. And uh, the, the nice thing is that the errors of this code can kind of be described, well, like, what would be an error? Now I'm going to switch to, um, I guess maybe I'll switch to green, because I heard that red wasn't as visible. Um, so like, what would be an error? So this Z check checks that like all these bits the parity of all these bits is the same. So if I flip, I'll just draw like a green line. Oops, that green marker is not working. Um, if I flip a bit here, I'll just like draw a green line where I flip. Maybe I'll make it like wiggly so it's a little more obvious. Then this parity check is, is off. Um, you, you, so I need to actually flip two here in order to make the um, parity check not get messed up. But then when I do that, well, this parity check's gonna, gonna get messed up. So you wind up needing to draw lines of flipped bits and the lines um, can go through. The only ones that aren't lines that go through is you could draw like sort of short lines of flipped bits that are like a, a flipped line that goes around like this. This is kind of, actually what I'm drawing is a line on the dual lattice. So I'm drawing between vertices like that. 
Um, you can draw these like really short lines. Dual lattice means I'm just like connecting points in the center of a plaquette, and if it crosses an edge, that means you flip it. Um, so you're doing the Z check here. Yeah, yeah, maybe it'd be cleaner if I did the X errors. Those might be more more visible. Yeah, I can do the the X errors um, on an X error. Let's say I flip an X error. If I if I make something here that would make an X error get violated, well then I need to flip another one here. But then this one's not happy, so I need to flip another one there. And you wind up drawing lines that go through the system and have to go all the way through the system. So that's when the whole Yeah, yeah. Now there's, there are like short lines that just go around in a tiny closed loop. Those are the shortest loops on it. But those are not, they don't, they actually are, the product of these flips around it is one of the stabilizers of your state. It's one of the checks on the state. It's some pattern of errors that is undetectable, but it's undetectable because it leaves, leaves the state completely unchanged. The important ones are the ones that go all the way across, and the length of those is L. So this is a 2L squared 2L code. Um, so as promised, this is a code that like, the distance can get as big as you want. You just make the thing bigger, um, and then the distance gets bigger. So it's, it's a nice family. So if you say you want a distance seven code, you make it a seven by seven distance, whatever you want, 11, 13, anything. Um, so this is a, uh, um, an important class of codes that are studied, and it turns out that it can be made fault tolerant if you're measuring these checks and then correcting. You need some classical control, and that's a difficult, um, that is, that is also a very difficult problem. You need to be measuring these checks inside your quantum computer, passing the information up. Um, for us, I would say like up in temperature, because for us, all this would be running at some very low temperature, up to some higher temperature where a classical computer is running, getting all these measurements and figuring out what errors have been made, like detecting where the errors occur, and then doing some, running some inference algorithm. It turns out to be a minimum weight perfect matching algorithm, typically, in order to fix it. Um, so this is like one of the standard things. Now, for Microsoft, um, this architecture is a little, this code is a little bit unhappy. And the reason is, um, I said you can measure these checks like Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4 um, by a circuit, a circuit that involves a bunch of gates, a bunch of gates that are like controlled not gates, XOR gates, stuff like that, just quantum analogs of some standard classical gates. Most architectures to build a quantum computer act by building a bunch of two qubit gates. They're backed by, you have some way of doing a gate on a single qubit, like rotating it, um, some way of measuring a property of a single qubit, like measuring whether it's polarized this way or that way, whatever, and then some two qubit gates, like this controlled not gate. Um, but uh, that is not how our proposed Majorana architecture will work. The basic thing that we do in our pr proposed Majorana architecture is uh, a little bit different, it's to take a pair of qubits and measure some property of the pair. Measure some property of the pair. That, it turns out, is what we can do. We can take two qubits and we can measure Z1, Z2, like the parity of them in the Z basis, or X1, X2, or you know, Z1, X2, or something like that. We can measure things on different qubits. We can't um, do the gates, except indirectly. By making these measurements, the funny thing is that it turns out that because these measurements can be in different bases. You can use them to change the state of the qubit by measuring it in different things. And you can effectively do the same computation. But this leads to a lot of overhead if we try to implement this kind of code. Instead of there being the standard circuit is kind of like a depth six circuit that does an entire round of this error correction that measures all these things and re returns the value of these Z checks and X checks. And then you would just keep running this round six circuit again and again and again. That's the standard approach. If we implement that circuit using what we can do with our Majorana qubits, um, optimistically it becomes a depth 10 circuit, but that requires more than one ancilla and a very complicated layout. Uh, um, without that extra ancilla, it becomes like a depth 20 circuit. So this is a uh, more difficult circuit for us to implement. So I'm just gonna like, and, and, and I have about, um, I guess about like 15 minutes or a little less left. I'm gonna now kind of talk about, you know, the, the, new, the new work after all this background. So any more questions up to this point? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it, so, so some of this will depend upon, like, yeah, I mean, in this case, it will still be L, whether it's periodic or if you have appropriate boundaries that are added. Um, but sometimes there are ways of gaining, like, if you do it at, like, a 45-degree rotated lattice on the plane, that can, you can change some of these factors of two a little bit. So there's some ways of, yeah, yeah getting some, like, order constant factor improvements over this. Yeah. 
by slightly better geometries. Um, any other questions? No? no. One more? So, so you mentioned that when you do, if you have errors on one of those groups, yeah. which are not with maybe with a constant number of yeah. so then it leaves the code word unchanged. So that's yes. Good. Yes. Because the error there is exactly one of your other checks, like the error, those four bit flips that messed up your Z check, that error was exactly one of your X checks, says that that leaves the state unchanged and vice versa. Um, this is actually all, um, yeah, I, I, yeah, it's all related to um, what you call like the uh, homology of the surface. It's looking for like the loops on the surface that are closed loops but are, can't be like, they're not the boundary of something. Um, yeah. Um, okay. So, so the uh, so so we came up with Jung Wen Ha and myself came up with a new code at Microsoft that we called the Honeycomb code, and it was really a new kind of quantum code, um, and it offers a number of advantages for the Majorana architecture. The threshold gets a lot better. This is the the tolerable error rate for the gates at which error correction is possible. For the surface code, people often say like a 1% threshold. The exact number varies, uh, but like once you get down to 1%, you can make your code better and better and better. Um, this is true, you would never wanna actually be close to that because okay, maybe if you're at 0.9, if you make your code big enough, you can make your error rate as small as you want to, but you will have an absolutely enormous overhead in order to get down to desired error rates because you'll need enormous codes. Um, so you never want to like sit near a threshold, but it's like a quick number to keep in mind. Whereas for Majorana devices, um, with this simple kind of surface architecture, the threshold was like an order of magnitude let lower with the exact number depending upon exactly how you, how many ansels you had and what kind of circuit you used. So um, this code was not so well suited for Majorana devices. On the other hand, this code that I'll talk about that is more suited, um, the threshold is back up to the same ballpark as the surface code. It's hard to exactly say what's better because this threshold is like combining everything into one number. It's saying, oh, this is how good you can do, this is what error rate you can tolerate. But real devices don't just have one error rate. There's different kinds of errors that can occur and different numbers for the different kinds of error rates that can occur. So you really should give the error rate as a function, you know, consider the actual device. Um, also, as I said, you don't want to actually operate near a threshold. You know, it's hopeless to be near a threshold. You really need your hardware to be well below threshold in order to build a useful device. So the important thing is, is threshold is a good proxy, but the important thing to also remember is um, what's the actual performance at error rates below threshold, and this flow K code is faster than the surface code for this, and it's, um, again, still lower, uh, lower um, uh, overhead. So this flow K code is uh, kind of a, a funny idea. Um, what we did is we said, well, we're going to build a honeycomb device. Um, so instead of instead of squares, everything's going to be on honeycombs. But again, it's going to be in the plane, which is great for actually building it. Um, great for actually building it. And I've been talking about X and Z for my checks, I need to add a new kind of measurement, which is Y. Um, what is Y like? Well, if you think about a photon, you know, yeah, you can have horizontal polarized, vertical polarized, you could have a 45 degree. You can also have like circularly polarized, like clockwise or anti-clockwise polarized. Um, so you can think of Y being like yet another basis in which you can measure it in. Um, so, and qubits on the vertices, on vertices, and uh, checks, well, every edge like this, the check is XX, meaning it's like X on this qubit, X on that qubit, like X1, X2. Every edge like that, the check is YY. Every edge like that, the check is ZZ. And so what you're doing is you're going like measuring XX checks here, YY checks here, and ZZ checks here. This is more like one of these subsystem codes. The checks disturb each other. When you measure one check, it messes up another check. So the checks, we would say, don't commute. Measuring one thing check messes up another check. So it sounds like a subsystem code. Um, if you use that formula I gave you for subsystem codes, like how many logical qubits does it have, you find that this code has no logical qubits. Um, there is no, no encoded quantum information in this code, so it doesn't sound useful. 
However, we had a particular idea, a way of measuring it. So what we did is um, we, we gave additionally some labels to the uh, hexagon, 0, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2. I would say we are three coloring the hexagon. So every hexagon gets a number 0, 1, or 2, such that um, no two hexagons of the same number are next to each other. So then this would be 0, 2, 1, and so on. So the, the hexagons all get different uh, numbers. And then, given that, we also gave another label to the edges. A zero edge is an edge that goes between two zero hexagons. So like, this is a zero edge because it goes between two zero hexagons. This is a zero edge because it goes between two zero hexagons. This is a zero edge. This is a zero edge. This is a zero edge. This is a zero edge, and so on. So zero edges are the ones that go um, between two hexagons of type 0. One edges are the ones that go between two hexagons of type 1. Two edges are the ones that go between two hexagons of type 2. Um, and we said, OK, these are the checks of the code, but you measure them in a particular sequence. You measure all the 0 checks, then all the 1 checks, then all the 2 checks. And you repeat the 0 checks, 1 checks, 2 checks, 0 checks, 1 checks, 2 checks, and so on. You repeat these measurements in some sequence, in, in, in exactly that sequence. And the interesting thing about that sequence is that um, it now winds up encoding quantum information. The reason to give like the heuristic explanation this didn't encode quantum information before as a subsystem code is that some of the checks you could measure, you would measure there would be products of the checks along a line that was like, like this, that that product of checks along a line was something that would measure the logical information of the code. But because you measure those checks in this way, and measuring the one checks destroys enough information about the zero checks, and measuring the two checks destroys enough about the one, it turns out you don't actually learn any of that information. And this winds up continuing to protect, um, protect quantum information with this particular way that things move around. Um, and this actually winds up being, I'll just draw some, some interesting pictures. Uh, I need to make this a little bit bigger. Uh, so this is 0, uh, this is 1, um, so here's another 0 edge, here's another 0 edge, here's another 0 edge, here's another 0 edge. Um, after you measure these 0 edges, there are two qubits out here, one here and one here. But you know something about them. You know that a certain check on them, you just measured it. So if these are, say, like 2 bits, you know that they're XOR is 1. So there's really only one logical bit on this edge. So what you can think of as this being some new code where there's just an effective logical bit on this edge. And um, at that point, it gets convenient to, oh yeah, this blue is good. Um, I'm going to draw, um, oops, a, dual, a dual lattice like this. So I'm just drawing, oops, I, I didn't draw my picture very well. I'm going to draw a dual lattice that goes through um, each of these blue lines goes, uh, um, yeah, like that, goes through um, one of these, these edges, which I just measured a, a zero check on. And if you look at it, it turns out that this, this dual lattice that you draw here is the same honeycomb lattice, but at a bigger scale. And what you wind up doing is producing a new code on this. And it's actually the same surface code as before. When I drew the surface code before, I did it with squares. But you can do the same surface code with a honeycomb. You can do it with a honeycomb and say, for every plaquette, there's z checks, and every vertex, there's x checks. You wind up generating the same honeycomb as before. And see, so this winds up being an interesting dynamically generated code. It's moving between different codes. Every, it's first one surface code, and then you measure a check, and it turns into another surface code. And you measure a check, and it turns into another surface code. And it kind of dances around with period three, because you go zero checks, one checks, two checks, and so on. Um, and it encodes quantum information and has this, uh, this high performance. And it's kind of a new class of um, coding theory. And I don't really have time to explain any more about it. So hopefully. <laughs> People learn something. Thank you. Yeah? So what are the parameters of this code and you do it in? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a similar like that n is proportional to um, uh, uh, um, the, the distance squared. Um, to give the exact number, things get now even a little more complicated to specify like what's the prefactor in terms of de depending upon distance squared because um, 
now measurement errors. For the surface code, if you just like measure something wrong, it doesn't destroy information. You just aren't able to correct it as well here. But if you measure it wrong, it can destroy it. So um, discussing the prefactor gets a little more subtle, but it's also the same kind of thing. Um, and there's, again, and again, when you want to compare it to surface code, when you say surface code is n k d squared and n is 2d squared, well, that didn't take into account that you needed those ancilla qubits to actually compute the thing. So n is really twice that. But then there's a way of putting it 45 degrees to make it back. So yeah, there's a lot of optimization of this. So um, you have to, I mean, you have to actually check the real, the real numbers for a real hardware. For us, it turns out to be a lot better. But I, maybe not for other, uh, um, other hardware. Surface, just a way to, to organize and figure out which checks need to be made, or is it's, an actual implementation? Yeah, it, it's both. It's both. Like originally, this was math. You know, it was it was a math. This was a way to organize it. It allowed you to bring in tools from topology to analyze it. Um, so originally, it was that. Um, but then, yeah, I mean, literally, they would be sitting here, and you know, like. The, I mean, the actual device, there's like some, the qubits would be, in this case, like for the Majorana architecture, the qubits would be some like links of topological superconductor joined in some way. That would be a single qubit. And then you'd have another one. And then to measure this check, you'd have to connect something here to allow some tunneling loop to go around there. So that's easiest to do if they're physically close. If they're physically far, you need to have longer range coherent links between them. Um, you need to worry about like one link crossing over another. So it turns out that this one lays out in a, in a convenient way. But yes, that would be actually where they're sitting in, in space. OK, so I think we are almost out of time. So let's thank the speaker again.